We did it We're live uh so you get yeah we, we can get snow into may but it's like it's happened once in my life and i think we had snow a couple of weeks ago which was pretty weird for sure so i but I, you know what i feel like all of the shows is fraser complaining about the weather for like the last six months maybe so well, what what's going on with you guys <laughs> Unless you want to hear me complain about well, Frazier, I I was going to complain about not being able to find an electrician, but yeah, I think you got me beat on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got got an electrician lined up. He's just waiting for the for the mechanical guy to Good. be able to install the heat pump. He's waiting for the concrete people to be able to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was going to wildly speculate about about what we're going to see tomorrow, but that's Leah's whole uh, whole story. So we don't want to we don't want to do that yet. <clears throat> Okay, you know what? We don't have a speculation right now. Boeing Starliner, May 19th. What do you think? Mm. Morgan. I saw it, that. It's a date. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a date will, that will it, in the will future. Will it launch before or after <laughs> SLS finishes its tests? But that's think... the date. They're, you know, they drove it to the pad. Like, they're going to be launching it. Now, chunks of the spacecraft are falling off. I mean, hitting they've the, driven it to the on pad the highway. before, only to drive it back from the pad. <laughs> it's I feel so, so bad, bad that even the rocket mover is breaking down now. Yeah, I mean, can we agree that having a second launch vehicle capable of delivering astronauts to the space station and boosting its orbit would be a good thing for spaceflight in general? That, that this a is absolutely this and is it, bad. Anybody who argues otherwise is sort of not not thinking it yeah. through. But I have no problem poking fun at billion dollar companies. Yeah. Well, and what I heard was that the essentially because it was Boeing, because it was traditional launch contractors, NASA gave them less oversight, and they spent all their time on SpaceX. And what do you know? SpaceX delivered, and I guess with less oversight. They've had a harder time. Well, do you remember when they like didn't have to run abort simu or tests and things because they they had simulations yeah. that were going to be good enough? Yeah, uh, I'm surprised that they really haven't made them ba go back and do all those parts again. Yeah, because they they definitely were kind of coasting on the legacy. Yeah, yeah. So it's so I really really hope they launch. I hope it goes fine, and I hope we have like a good healthy competition. But I but I agree with you. It's it's perfectly. It's perfectly fine to poke fun at uh, at Boeing and, and team. That's all right. All right, uh, let's let's begin. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, May eleventh, twenty twenty two. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week we're going to be talking about a new Hubble competitor from China. Uh, what you can do with lunar soil and other resources. Perseverance lost contact with Ingenuity, but got it back. 
CO2 frost creating cool avalanches on Mars? And what will the Event Horizon Telescope be announcing tomorrow? I wonder what it could be. Uh, joining me this week, we've got uh, Carolyn Collins-Peterson. Hey, Carolyn. Hi, how you doing? Good. Congratulations on your new gig writing for Universe Today. How's that working out for you? Um, I'm, I'm getting wealthier by the day. You know, it's great. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually having a lot of fun. It's it's uh, every time I look up a story or I find something, I think, how can I make this cool? And I'm having yeah, a lot no, of fun it's so been, far. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've been surprisingly prolific, terrifyingly prolific. But but so far it's been it's been great to have you join the thank you the the group of freelance writers so definitely check it out Carolyn's been providing a bunch of articles on Universe today it's been it's been going really well we've got uh, Leah Jenks hey Leah welcome back hi there. how are you good good um and what and what about you what's going on well um I finished a couple weeks a uh, couple weeks ago I'm done with my PhD so that's been big wait so, so we get do we get to say doctor. I think so, I guess. Why? Yeah. You, you buried the lead, Leah. <laughs> but yeah, so I've been enjoying um, post-dissertation life. Yeah. And speculating about what this uh, big announcement tomorrow is. What time did you wake up this morning? <laughs> like before or afternoon? It. It's been great. Yeah. Good. Well, congratulations. That's Thank awesome. You. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and we've also got Dr. Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey Fraser, hey everybody. And how is your new gig going? Uh, it's going great. Busy, 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 busy. I, I unlike my promise from last month, I did not set my lights up, but I'm coasting on the fact that it's now a month later and there's sunlight coming through the window. So right. let's just, so you're just uh, gonna go with hit that the gas, light. hit the gas on this, and uh, get to the end. But have you been able to implement some new cool exhibits? Oh, I mean, it's starting to. We've got a couple of projects that'll be um, opening to the public this fall that I've come in just in time to kind of put my my stamp mm -hmm. on. And so just kind of try, trying to wrap my head around everything that is in progress right now is something that's still sort of ongoing. But I, I know where all the like bathrooms are and things now. And I'm starting mm -hmm. to just get a sense of where the, you know, where, where in the building things are. And that seems like a good step before trying to make too many dramatic changes that's that's exciting all right um all right so before we move on to our special guest interview i just want to give a huge shout out and thank you to our good friends at the weekly space hangout crew they're our friends our fans but really our executive producers they call the shots they tell us what to do we show up we obey and so if you want that kind of ultimate executive power over me and the rest of the team Join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Go to wshcrew.space, and I promise they will hook you up. They'll give you all of the tools you need to just bark orders at me and, and have me run around and interview people. No problem. Speaking of uh, of interviewing people, we've got uh, Dr. Simone Scaringi. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Scaringi. Scaringi, uh, okay. Yeah. I wasn't. Hi. Uh, so, so w welcome. So who are you? What do you do? Um, who am I? I'm Simone. People call me Simo. Uh, I try my best at being an astronomer, although sometimes it doesn't always work out very well. Um, technically, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Durham in the UK. So I kind of split my time half doing research, the other half teaching or trying to teach. Um, and yes, I like white dwarfs and uh, I like data. So, I mean, your research definitely made the rounds over the last couple of weeks. And this is the announcement that there's a new kind of Nova, a micro Nova. Hmm. So, so tell us about your research. What, uh, what did you discover? Okay. So specifically on the micro Nova, um, what, what we found on uh, three systems, uh, we found these bright bursts of light which lasted about 10 hours or or just maybe a bit more um, and I, I should give you a bit of a background as to what these systems are but the observational feature was that we couldn't explain these bursts for over a year and we literally scratched our head my colleagues and I until we kind of made a connection that, that, that what we were seeing could actually be a thermonuclear explosion on the surface of a white dwarf. And that's where the NOVA comes in. 
classical NOVA have been known to be thermonuclear explosions, which essentially cover the whole surface of a white dwarf star. Um, the, the bursts we saw <clears throat> were about one millionth uh, of the energy of a, of a classical NOVA, and that's where the kind of prefix micro comes in. So these right. are small NOVA. So in a, in a you know, nutshell, that's... And, and so like the traditional NOVA, as opposed to a supernova, but just a regular mm -hmm. NOVA, is like where the white dwarf is feeding from some companion star and this material wraps around the star and eventually you get enough and it undergoes a thermonuclear explosion, clears it off, and then it starts again, and you get That's this correct. regular detonation. That's so then correct. so then what what could so it, it gave, I guess, the same signature as a nova, but with dramatically less energy? Well, okay, we, we, we think uh, again, this this is really fresh and new. This 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 kind of discovery, um, but yes, it has um, the the shape of the brightness variations that we observed um, were so fast that we just could not explain them with any other uh, ideas we had, and it wasn't until we the connection to similar bursts that are observed in neutron stars. So neutron star binaries uh, go through a very similar process in the sense that they accrete material, they build a layer around their surface, and then they go bang. Mm -hmm. But because neutron stars are so small, the brightness variations that we've known for uh, a decade or so, they only last about a minute. But when you go and compare the brightness variations that neutron stars show and the ones that we saw in, in, in white dwarfs, they look like carbon copies of each other. And so we started to think, hmm. oh, maybe what we're seeing here is actually a thermonuclear explosion. And so just uh, for comparison, like if like mm -hmm. a regular Nova, how long does one of those last to brighten oh. up and then fade away again? Oh, they, 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 weeks, months, weeks. Months, and so yeah. you're seeing this in terms of just hours in terms of just hours that is correct huh. yeah okay all right so you've got this explosion that looks very much like i guess material piling onto a neutron star mm -hmm. but only lasting a very short period of time mm -hmm. what is it so we we so we started again to scratch our heads once we realized that that these could be thermonuclear explosions then we had to think about how is it possible that material um, uh, uh, doesn't spread? Because essentially what's happening here is the reason why they're so fast is because the fresh hydrogen that has been sucked in from the companion star, rather than building a layer around the white dwarf, what we think is actually happening is that the material is being funneled and, and, and stays contained at the magnetic poles of these wow. white dwarfs. That's you just incredible. That, that, that yeah, it, it requires a bit of imagination, I agree. But we have, uh, we have evidence for the fact that these white dwarfs are actually strongly magnetized. So, so, uh, so I mean, spin. right. So I guess what is the, you know, in this situation, you've got a white dwarf with a companion star. The white dwarf is, is, generating this magnetic field but do all white dwarfs generate this level of a magnetic field is there something about the interaction with the companion star is it the age what's going on so not all um, accreting white dwarfs have such strong magnetic fields nonetheless there's plenty out there that that, that are magnetic and the way we find these <clears throat> is again by looking at their brightness variations and we actually can detect the spin of the white dwarf. So the spin periods of these objects can vary from um, uh, tens of seconds to half an hour-ish. That, that's more or less how fast these white dwarfs spin. Uh, so there's there's plenty out there that, that are magnetic, not all. Then the question becomes, why do these objects that we found show these micronova and not the others? Mm -hmm. And that's still a bit of an open question. Um, one uh, idea is that, um, and this again, it's, it, it, it's taken as an analogy from classical NOVA, 
is that the white dwarfs we observed could be uh, relatively more massive than than what white dwarfs usually are. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, like we know that the white dwarfs will continue this process with the Nova. They'll they'll steal material from a companion star. It'll pile up on the surface. It'll blast off, but some will remain and then it'll do it again and do it again until it does it one last time and you get a type yeah. 1a supernova you'd think but it's not that's actually uh that's still an open question i would say because every time you get a nova explosion a classical nova it could be that actually each nova explosion erodes the underlying white dwarf a bit so it's i i don't think it's still established that over time um a creating white dwarf that shows recurrent nova, so classical nova that happen on, on some time scale, grows in mass. It could be that every time you have one of these explosions, the explosion is so uh, energetic that you actually throw away more mass than you accumulated during that time. So it's 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 still an that, open question. That just blew my mind. Yes. Um, yes it, so it, then it, how do you get type 1A supernova? Well, there's there's two... Uh, channels we call them so one is the one we just talked about so a creating material on the white dwarf until you reach the Chandrasekhar limit the so-called Chandrasekhar limit and you you can explode the other channel is white dwarf mergers uh, right it could it could be that you could have two white dwarfs spiraling into each other but could you have figured out a, th a third way or maybe the be real way do you mean with micronova with micronova that you're because yeah. that you're that it's a smaller right. amount and maybe it's not blowing a chunk of the it's act it is actually accreting material onto the white dwarf um i i i don't think so i don't, I don't want to put my my bets on it <laughs> okay uh, all right but um again because because it's still not clear what what really happens in classical nova where the white dwarfs grow in mass or not um from, from our analysis, what we think is happening is all the material that was piled up is then ejected into during okay. the explosion, more or less the same material. So, yeah. but but you're saying that maybe this happens because you have a more massive white dwarf. Yes, we we th that that would help the thermonuclear explosion uh, start. The reason is because uh, well, more massive white it's it's. Let, let me put it this way. It's, it's a game of pressure. So how much pressure are we, uh, do, does the fresh material uh, provide? And if we reach a certain pressure, then we can ignite. Now, right. more massive white dwarfs uh, will allow the pressure of the, of the overlaying material to be higher. But there's this thing about white dwarfs that the more massive they are, the smaller they are as well. So they're, white dwarfs are, are, are strange objects. You'd think that more massive white dwarfs would be bigger, but they're not, they're smaller, which actually helps build up the pressure even more. And helps with their spin. I'm, like, I'm guessing that also helps Absolutely. with creating a more dynamic magnetic field. Yes, yes, yeah. So, so there's, there's a few things that seem to point to us that, that more massive white dwarfs are better candidates. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, what would set up the conditions for this? But when I think about saying like neutron stars, like when a neutron star first forms, it is spinning very rapidly. And that's how you get pulsars. And then over time, they slow down. Do you think that the age of the white dwarf is some factor to this? Ooh, um... I, I, I am not sure these 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 binaries are are, are old in the sense that they, they've, you know, we've only observed them uh, having these micronova now, but they must have done it for uh, you know, millions of years, I think. Right. Um, right. So, but, but it is interesting. How, how does the spin of the white dwarf change over time? Um, and it's not clear. Again, there, there's, uh, you, you mentioned neutral stars start spinning rapidly and then slow down. Well, some neutral some neutral stars actually spin up because they're accreting material. Right, if they have a companion. Yeah. Yes, yes, they, if they have a companion. Um, and so white dwarfs also do the same. Sometimes we see them spin up. Sometimes we see them spin down. Um, right. But some 
produce micronova while others produce classical nova? Well, there's one object, interestingly enough, uh, that has come out in the literature um, very recently, in fact, that appears to show both. Oh, micronova wow. and is a, is a known recurrent nova. So there's this one system, which we will have to obviously study and observe a lot more to understand, but it looks like it, it in, in, in the past they had shown classical nova. And when the Kepler uh, spacecraft observed it uh, years ago, it just happened to catch it during a phase where it, it had these bursts. Uh, which look remarkably similar to the micronova we, we published uh, recently. So it could be that there's one object that actually can do both. Which... Now, you mentioned Kepler. Um, yeah. Was that the main tool for discovering these objects? Or what is the main way the that main, you've been finding them? The main tool was TESS. Uh, was TESS, okay. TESS, which is a kind of successor, if you want, yeah. to, to Kepler. Um, yes, I have a program with TESS to observe accreting white dwarfs. So my, my kind of uh, uh, real interest, uh, well, now it's micronova, but generally speaking, it's accretion disk physics. So, and I use uh, white dwarfs as kind of accretion disk laboratories. I but, look at white dwarfs, yeah. Oh, but I was just thinking, sorry, like in the case of tests, you've got, you know, you're only able to detect the planets that are that are lined up to do the transit method but i'm guessing in your situation it doesn't have to be pointed at earth it can be just a explosion off the star in any way or does it have to be channeled in our direction uh, uh what are you sorry Fraser, what are you so so to? like is does the orientation of the white dwarf matter when you observe it to see the micronova you mean to see the micronova yeah yes. do we have to be staring uh, down the barrel of no, the micronova not necessarily. we don't think no not necessarily why because when the explosion uh, happens uh, the radiation that comes out is not necessarily collimated in one direction it spreads out right so although it can happen at one uh, like one of the magnetic poles of the white dwarf we would see it uh, through half of the sky if you want. So uh, unless, you know, the white dwarf is obstructing our line of sight, we would see it. So uh, we would see it. So how often do you think this is happening compared to a more classical nova? Uh, so these micronova we think happen on a time scale of every few hundred days, actually. So they're quite regular. Uh, on the other hand, classical nova have recurrence times of thousands of years. There are some that have much shorter recurrence times, so tens of years, mm -hmm. uh, but, but but nothing like a few hundred days. And um, and are they more common? Just like are there more stars having micronovae than classical novae? Do you think? That's a hard question to answer. We found three, and we only found three because we had so much data from ten. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, these things only last for, for a few hours. So if you're not looking at the right place at the right time, you'll miss them. On the other hand, classical Nova, when they go off, they are bright. Right. They are, you know, even you can see uh, them with your own eyes in some you cases. Can see that, yeah, exactly. So missing a classical Nova is, is, you know, unless it's behind the sun and we, we, we're just blinded yeah. by the sun, we'll see it. But a so, micro Nova on the other hand. Yeah. So would something like Vera Rubin give you the observational evidence that you would need to really find more of these? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Something that would scan the sky over and over again uh, on, on a cadence of every night would pick up a lot more of these. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations on discovering a new class of of phenomena out there. It's very rare that you get a chance to, you know, to to add one to the to the list and this one's adorable so Cheers. that's just that yeah. goes that goes twice it's, well congratulations it's, on uh, on your work so I, and thank I you for thank letting us all my collaborators as well right it's not just me there's a whole team behind it as well yeah absolutely absolutely um well and if you uh if you do find more of them please let us know <laughs> sure all right thank you all right take care I'll leave. bye all right um Man, nice get, Nancy. That was so cool. That was so cool. That was so exciting. Um, 
All right. I'm starstruck. Okay. Do your job, Fraser. Carolyn, let's talk about a new space telescope from China. Right. So this week, uh, we got a, we got a, a notification that the Chinese are building the China Space Station. <clears throat> sorry, China Space Station Telescope, which I'd actually heard about a couple of years ago, but they weren't giving many details about. It was formerly called Shunqian, um, X U N T I A N. And it's now in under construction and is supposed to be launched at the end of this year. I, I don't, can't find a launch date for it. Yet. It's essentially a two meter telescope. It'll have a three mirror sort of, uh, and I can't say this very well, NS Digmatic design. Uh, it's set off, off axis so that you don't get these obstructions like telescopes will get. Right. You get, um, you'll get all nice those star it. spikes that's freaking everybody out about James yeah. Webb. Well, yeah, that's right. Oh, aren't they pretty though? Yeah, well, yeah but I just yeah. I get no end of questions about them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I remember with Hubble, people used to put, they think we were putting them in and uh, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, um, so it's going to have a set of five instruments, and I think those are replaceable. The imaging system will have this amazing array of 30 81 megapixel detectors. Um, they are boasting that it will have a much larger field of view than Hubble. And I, I, I have to admit, the stories I read about this this week are great. The Chinese are saying everything is going to be better. They, they want to out Hubble Hubble yeah. with this thing, which I with think a is smaller, just so With a smaller amusing. telescope. With a smaller with a, telescope. Right. But there's a bigger there's field only of view, one right? number yeah. that matters, and that is the size yeah, of your yeah, primary. Bigger. Let's be honest here. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right. So 2.6. Hubble's yeah. two point six. It's two meters. The case is yeah, closed. Yeah. The race has been lost. But they, but they, you know, they're going to out Hubble Hubble. So, which I've really found amusing because for years, you know, we've seen an announcement. Oh, Gemini is going to do this picture better than Hubble or whatever. Everything was going to be better than Hubble. When you think thirty two years ago, nobody would be near Hubble <laughs> because we had this broken telescope. So, so this, you know, it's kind of interesting how thirty years things change. Anyway, so like I said, this thing's, oh, it's going to be sensitive to a range of light from near infrared to near to visible to near ultraviolet. Yeah. So that's a real Hubble Which is not quite the perfect detector, but it's actually cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I saw a lot of comments about the story when I, after I posted it and people were saying, they're stealing all the Hubble ideas. And I got to tell you, there are no new ideas in telescope design. There's just refinements. So, you know, more power to them. This is what they want to do. Um, it's going up on a long March 5B. Uh, again, I'm not sure what date that is. And they have very familiar observing targets, you know, all, as many galaxies as they can get. I think they said something like, you know, billions and billions of galaxies that they want to look at. They want to solve the dark matter problem. They want to solve the dark energy problem. And then looking at things all the way down to exoplanets and star forming regions and comets and asteroids. The feature of this thing that I really like the best is that it has its own repair bay. So originally yes. this thing was going to be put on the space station, the Tiangong space station. But you think about this, the space station is going to be vibrating. There's spacecraft coming and going. So you have, you're going to have endless problems with vibrations, knocking the, the you know, the thing's very sensitive to, to motion. Uh, you get spacecraft coming in and out, you could contaminate the mirrors. So they decided, no, we're not going to attach this to the space station. We're actually going to park it some safe distance away in the same orbit at about 200, I forget how far up, 250 miles or something like that. About this, yeah, I really forget, but um, up there. And then whenever it needs any kind of maintenance or refurbishing, it just kind of moseys back over to the station, parks itself, and they do the work on it. That so is I think that's pretty really cool. smart. Yeah, yeah. Really cool. Yeah, yeah. When you think about, like, can you imagine if Hubble was placed in the same orbit, roughly yeah. the same orbit as the space station, and then if they ever needed to do any repairs, they could bring it over, and then it's in spacewalking. Yeah. Yeah. range it's exactly the kinds of of evas that they do on the international space station already i think that's that's a that's a real stroke of genius to to do that configuration well and not only that they learned this is a lesson they did learn from hubble which is don't put all your eggs in one basket for i'm missing everything she's saying and we lost her you got to yeah i think it's it's super cool even if you know even if your mission does go perfect that means that your lifetime is just going to be longer and longer and eventually you're going to want to throw new new optics or new uh ccds or, or whatnot yeah. on there so it's it right yeah so even if you even if things go great eventually you're going to want to touch the thing 
you know, knock, knock, knock James Webb. Yeah. 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 That seems like they're doing a good job of foreseeing, you know, future problems and upgrades they want to do. To fix how well it's built. Um, so I guess, I mean, it feels to me like it's a bit of a, like when you think about Nancy Grace Roman, it's a Hubble class telescope, same, same mirror size, but it has that much wider field of view. The same thing, a hundred times bigger than Hubble. I forget the exact number, but roughly that, but it's a, it's a infrared telescope while this is a visible near infrared and and near ultraviolet and so that's a yeah and so that is i mean it, it there is i've you know for that they're right there is not a telescope in orbit that has that wide field of view matched with those wavelengths so yeah Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you should reload your screen, Carolyn. You are frozen. I think you leave and then come back. I don't even think that that um, that I don't know if Pamela can even hear you. So so try leaving the meeting and then coming back into it. I'm sure it'll work. Yeah. Okay. All right. And we'll do. We'll, we will move on to uh, Morgan. Let's let's talk about ingenuity and curiosity. Oh, sorry, and perseverance. Yeah, talk about a talk about a, a, a serious love story going on here. Uh, we're going into the f winter season in the northern hemisphere in Mars right now, and this is like a bad time to be a rover uh, because it's going to get really, really cold on um, on the surface. Now, in like the warm season in, in northern hemisphere summer, Mars can get to the temperature like. Earth temperatures. We could walk around with a spacesuit on and and no like warm warming clothing. But at, at at the winter, it gets colder and colder, much colder even than Antarctica. And and one of the effects that that has is if your spacecraft isn't sort of functioning optimally, it's going to end up freezing to death. And we saw this happen with uh, Spirit and Opportunity, where eventually they kind of got stuck and they were fine until it became winter. And then thus, they were not generating enough energy from their solar panels, and they would freeze to death. And fortunately, that's sort of maybe what's happening with Ingenuity. So Ingenuity is building up dust on its uh, solar panels that are on, on its, uh, and on its wings. And that's really reducing the amount of power that, that the helicopter can generate. Uh, and as of the most recent reading, it's only being able to charge its battery up to 41%. Uh, and so that's like a peak, you know, in, end of day charge level. And, and so at times it's dipped so low that instruments have started to shut down. And so on May 3rd, uh, it lost contact with Perseverance, or, or rather Perseverance lost contact with it and was sort of unable through the normal procedures to reestablish that connection. Um, and so what the commission controllers decided to do was actually sort of stop Perseverance, have it stop all science operations so that there would be the sort of least amount of electromagnetic and noise going on to make it most sensitive to try to listen to and hear Ingenuity trying to reestablish contact. And a about a day later, it, it worked and, and they heard it again. Oh, good. And so we are, I mean, we're well on into overtime with Ingenuity at this point. Well, that's, yeah, that's, I think, the sort of big takeaway here is, you know, we're just over a year now from the first test flights, which were happening in mid-late April of 21. And when the mission landed, the whole point was it's going to do these five short demonstration test flights, and then Perseverance was going to leave it behind. And it was going to be left uh, in the dust while, um, while the science mission continued. And now here we are 12 months later, around 30 flights later, and not only are they not leaving it behind, but they're actually interrupting Perseverance's science operations and, and science schedule just to try to reconnect with the helicopter. And, and I think that's just such a 
sign of this enormous success that Ingenuity uh, had. And I think m many people um, were skeptical going into this mission that the helicopter would work, that mm -hmm. it would be useful, that it would, you know, that it would be something we should keep doing. And now I think it's sort of hard to imagine a future Mars mission that didn't include an Ingenuity like oh, helicopter. Yeah. And, and the fact that we're not we're not willing to leave behind something that's probably about to um, to die anyway is a sign of sort of how invested the mission team has become in the utility of of this instrument. And and I think you know they'd gone through all of the all of the testing parts and they were shifting into the now let's try putting this thing to work and they're doing things like scouting out fairly rough terrain to see if they could find an easy path around it like that's that's perfect and be able to find interesting rocks to to give a much wider field of view it's like a geologist's dream like i know when you talk to geologists they want that they want that wide angle view to know everything in context and then you want the the part that you're specifically looking at and that's what these flying that's what ingenuity brings to the table it's stunning right in the past we've had to rely mostly on images from Mars reconnaissance orbiter that are looking down at the at the rover to get some context it literally has a camera called context on it uh that would allow these wider angles but there you're looking sort of straight down and so sure you can sort of chart the path around craters and things like that but you're missing the three-dimensional element that you get from a more isometric view yeah. and, and that's really filling in the gap between the ultra wide view of mars reconnaissance orbiter and the ultra narrow view of being on the ground is this sort of gap that I think we didn't realize how valuable it was to fill in that gap. And you, you, like I said, you can't imagine that they're not going to do this on the next mi mission and plan the mission design on the assumption that this sort of um, capability will be there. I mean, but we've got to we've got to find a way to keep the rover alive through the winter if yeah. if that's really going to be a successful future endeavor. I mean, I think you could imagine, like anyone could have imagined, would a flying helicopter buzzing around your rover be helpful? Every geologist could could instantly tell you the the value of it. But just the, that it was even possible on Mars is is what's mind blowing. And not only is it possible, it seems incredibly successful and lightweight and relatively inexpensive compared to the, the main payload. You're exactly right. Let's add two of these to every to every future future mission now if you if you take the sort of the sum response to this on the internet on twitter etc it is why don't they just why don't they just morgan why don't they just dust it off why don't they just second. flip it around well, why, why don't, don't they, they just, just have a yes why don't they yeah, that's just... a good question um and i think the answer is we don't really have anything that can move the air but that doesn't mean that we can't do this in the future. Um, you know, I, I, going back to this idea that next missions are going to plan for this to be an integral part, the way Spirit and Opportunity survived for a decade or more on Mars was having dust devils come by and blow off the dust from the top of the solar panels. It doesn't seem crazy to me that you could engineer the next um, rover to have like a fan basically on it that you know, you'd park, you'd park the helicopter, you know, saunter on over with the rover and right. just bl blow it, in. and that doesn't seem super outlandish to me. And I'm yeah. sure you could come up with all sorts of interesting science experiments that would utilize the fan as well, like and, a compressed and, air nozzle. Sure, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you can imagine on like the hand imager, you have like a compressed air nozzle with it, and that would be great for blowing the dust away from the rock that you're trying to look at as well. And in addition, you can use that to dust off your helicopter. That that totally makes sense to me too. Yeah. 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 We were so serious about this being a test mission that they didn't include anything that wouldn't literally support those five flights. Yeah. And you know, that's somehow sometimes NASA can be so conservative that they kind of bite themselves like that in, in some of the same ways we saw with spirit and opportunity where we said these yeah. are going to be 90 day missions that oh actually last 13 years yeah there's a bit of a mismatch there and wanting to be conservative so we're not 
failing when we think we should succeed, but not allowing us necessarily to succeed to the fullest extent that's possible. Yeah, I, um, I that's why I'm, I'm a huge fan of like the Japanese missions, because I feel like they balance su success and risk in the right, like wacky ideas matched with success in just the right mixture. I wish I wish that NASA would get a little crazier and a yeah, little there's the yellow factor. Yeah, Jackson, exactly. That just kind of has a magic that, yeah. that sometimes works and sometimes is a terrible failure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, but it's still it's, it's exciting. That, I mean, we're well into overtime. Every additional flight that we get with this helicopter is a is a wonderful bonus. And so if we uh, can make it through the next six or eight weeks, then ingenuity will likely live to see next year uh if if not well we we did what we could to keep it going yeah but i wonder if it, it, if it does stop transmitting it's probably not dead so maybe there's got to be some way you know because per, perseverance put it up, pick it up that's what i was back. thinking yeah perseverance just puts on its back <laughs> it's got carries it along work. yeah <laughs> and then when then when the sun comes back it puts it back down it'll be and like the ultimate buddy it. movie yeah yeah it's it really like is a, a, very a cool. rover and his helicopter on Mars. All right. Awesome. All right. Dr. Jenks. How, how does that feel? Does it that feel still good? feels very weird, but I'll weird? take it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Jenks, tell us what's going to be happening tomorrow. Yes. So this is very exciting. I wish this was, had happened already so that we could talk about it, the, the actual news instead of the speculation. But basically tomorrow, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration uh, shown here in this little picture, is holding a press conference. I believe it's at 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, 1 p.m. UTC. And um, they're going to be discussing a groundbreaking Milky Way discovery. Okay. Um, and so the general consensus as to what that means um, is that they are likely going to show a picture of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star which is very exciting. Uh, the previous uh, black hole picture that they found, or that they observed was from the M87 galaxy um, in 2019, which was a huge deal seeing a picture of a black hole for the first time, even more confirmation of Einstein's theory of gravity, um, a really exciting moment in you know space and gravitation. And now um, potentially they're going to uh, show us a picture of the one in the center of our galaxy. Um, which we know is there. Um, so this is uh, this little image. You can we know it's there because of the um, orbits of the stars close to the center of the galaxy. Um, this is what uh, Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel won the Nobel Prize for in 2020, I guess uh, two years ago. And um, they observed over like 20 years or some very long amount of time um, what the stars were doing in the center of our galaxy. And they found that these stars were orbiting um, this, you know, mysterious, massive object. They didn't know what it was. Um, eventually, we determined it was a black hole. And um, the Event Horizon Telescope is hopefully going to show us that. Um, and I think it's it going to be, ho hopefully, again, I could, it could be something else. I could be wrong. Um, but if they are showing us this, I think it'll be an incredible scientific feat. Um, in the M87 galaxy, it was easier to do because it's a much larger black hole. I think the one in uh, Sagittarius A star is supposed to be about 4 million solar masses, whereas this one is about 6.5 billion. So it's much, much larger. And M87 is face on, so we can see it pretty clearly from Earth. Um, whereas in the case for Sagittarius A star, we have to look through the plane uh, like the disk of the Milky Way. So if the Milky Way is here, the black hole's here, we're here. We have to look through all of the gas and dust and everything else that's in the way um, that's not allowing us to see it. So I think it'll be um, a really incredible just scientific feat that they're able to, you know, get this image. Um, and then also hopefully once we have the image, there's a lot of really exciting um, science that can be done with it, which I'm super excited about so the Leah, here, here here's my question and not to be like uh jaded about these things 
But like, how? I mean, how likely is it to look like different from that one? Like, as you were saying, my understanding is sort of you know M eighty seven way farther away, but way bigger. And that they kind of cancel out almost, and that the sort of expected resolution of the, you know, Sag A Star 1 it isn't really s- super different. Are we going to see just like another smudgy orange thing, do you think? Or is it going to look like notably, amazingly different? So, I mean, I think so. I'm not a member of EHT, um, but just based on, yeah, what I know, I do think it will probably look similar. Um, I think we'll probably have, you know, we'll see the accretion disk, um, all the gas that's around it. It will probably be similar. We may be able to also, they may give us the um, polarization image like they did for M87. Mm -hmm. Um, I would guess, though, in the last couple years, perhaps their data analysis kind of pipelines have uh, improved and gotten better. So potentially um, there would be some improvements from that end but i do think the image will probably look similar but gives us now you know two data points instead of one uh yeah. and i think you know that's enough to draw a line <laughs> yeah the the you know when i when when, it, when m87 came out and i was like wait what why didn't we get sag star and i reached out to a bunch of the astronomers and they're like well it actually was really tricky because e- because Sag A star is so much smaller. It's a much more dynamic mm-hmm. environment. Things are changing a lot more quickly, and it's really tricky to align the data as opposed to M87. As you say, it's it's orders of magnitude bigger, and so everything is moving f- far slower, and so it's much easier, and you have the gas and dust. My guess is it's going to be worse. My mm-hmm. guess is that it's you've got the you have the obscuring gas and dust you've got the dynamic activity around it and yet they're visually the same size on the sky that's a lot to to it's going to be tricky to pull through it and and my guess is it took them this long because people were getting frustrated and and impatient and going like just show us already so the we did a little so pamela and i speculated in astronomy cast about this mm-hmm. so let's give give me your it's not what you think it is prediction. So if it's not Sag A star, so my um, dream, I guess, would it, is that it would be some sort of other type of exotic compact object. Um, with, so like something we haven't seen before that has some sort of okay. unique, you know, radio signature that they're picking up. Like, um, but I think, but did they but did they run did they do a secret run of the event horizon telescope and they didn't tell us like like they haven't been pointing the event horizon telescope at different targets they, right they, just, they did their big observing run so it's so it's got to be something in that picture i mean all we could think of is that they saw really two black holes or something they saw, well, like yeah, yeah they just saw the black that. hole do yeah. something weird mm-hmm. unexpected like it they saw it eat some gas and dust or they saw it interact with something nearby, or as you said, maybe there is a, a companion black hole that was that we didn't know about already. It feels like otherwise, why didn't they just say, we're going to reveal the picture that you've all been waiting for us to reveal? Right, that's a good point. So it's, so we were racking our brains under the constraints that you have to think of what it could possibly be. And there's, you know, so all you got is something extra, a bonus weirdness on top of the picture that is groundbreaking. Remember, it's groundbreaking. So a picture of a of an event horizon of a supermassive black hole is not groundbreaking anymore. <laughs> We've done that. That ground is broken. So what would break ground? Yeah, I do wonder. That would be interesting if it was if somehow in the center of the galaxy there were two or some other yeah like companion that would be very cool. yeah like if uh, you could see a black hole eating material with during the event horizon telescope's observation and you were super lucky that it was actually going in wow. that would probably help answer some questions about about relativity and Einstein, all that kind of stuff. And so but what would it even look like on their little smudge image? A difference, another smudge. That smudge uh, over yeah. there. Yeah, I think that would be so hard to even yeah, tell guess, yeah. like the difference on given all of the 
the challenges that you were mentioning of um, seeing it to begin with. I don't know, but yeah. that would definitely maybe there'd Some be a distinct bright smudge. blob, a bright blob on one side of the smudge, and that they've done the math and the polarization and whatever, and they're like, that is a star getting consumed by the by the black hole, and we got a chance to see it happen. That's that's all I've got. So. Uh, very cool. Well, then I guess we're gonna have to find out. We could... yeah, one so more sleep. Yeah, hopefully talks about it next week. Once you all, once we all have the answer, yeah. um, we can discuss. We'll, we'll give you a call. We'll let you know what happened. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Carolyn. What else you got for us? Can you hear me all right now? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I'm, I think I'm sort of becoming the China expert here, even though I'm not. But uh, the other story that I thought was kind of interesting this week was about how we can find resources on the moon to, uh, to, to, or how, you know, future people living on the moon can use the lunar resources to make things like fuel and, and oxygen and water and that sort of thing. And there was a team of scientists at the Nanjing University in China, and they've been studying samples back to earth from the Chang'e 5 mission. And what they found in, in these uh, samples has been something that would basically help them understand how you could make water and oxygen and fuel such as methane, for example, to get around, um, which would be important for long-term habitation. I think the Chinese do have a big interest in getting people onto the moon, just as we all do. Um, so it turns out that the lunar soil that they've been studying is rich in materials that can convert carbon dioxide into oxygen to make fuels. Um, the, the sample also seems to be abundant in iron and titanium, which is kind of interesting. So that's one source of raw materials that you could use to build habitats and, and get breathable air and water and all that sort of thing. Um, another source of raw materials that they're looking at is what I sort of politely termed astronaut exhaust, which is um, as astronauts work in their space suits on, on the moon, they're gonna breathe out water vapor and carbon dioxide. And if you can capture that, you can certainly use it to make your materials uh, for, for the things that you need. And it would really be a shame to just let that escape, you know, so why not use what you have? And that kind of goes along with a lot of really interesting resampling, uh, recycling ideas that I've seen, not just for the moon, but for Mars as well. So the team has come up with this um, strategy that they call extraterrestrial photosynthesis. And it would use the water that you get from the astronauts from lunar soil and the lunar soil you could get water from that. You also have the possibility of grabbing lunar ice from the from the poles, um, but to make um, and get the materials from the astronauts and plus the elements in the soil itself, and then use that in, in a sort of a special machine to create methane, which could be used for a fuel. And then you kind of reverse the process or you tweak it another way and you can make water, you can get oxygen. So the beauty of this is that it uses local materials that you don't have to pay to bring up from earth on a rocket. And as we all know, um, there are definite costs to lofting stuff up out of the gravity well of Earth. Once you get your, your uh, people on the moon or on Mars, for example, even, you really want to be able to use local materials to, to create the consumables that you need. And so that's the study that, that I was kind of interested in this week. So, I mean, did they come to some kind of conclusion that there is, – is that a cat? I saw, I saw the yes. tail. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I've been trying to keep her out of the camera. So. That's fine. I think you should encourage her to come into the camera. <laughs> oh, well, um, all right. If you want to yeah. see her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, did they get a sense of like how easy it's going to be to do in situ resource utilization on the moon to get some of these resources? Well, the first thought that came to my mind is you're going to have to have a lot of it. To, if you're going to have, you know, a colony of, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 people up there, that's a lot of resources that you're going to have to that you're going to have to come up with. So you're going to have to scramble for a lot of that soil. And I think the one question I have is, is are these abundances that they're finding, are they constant across the moon? You know, obviously you're going to have the, you know, the high, you know, the water that you can get out of things, squeezing rock, you know, water out of rocks. But um, what about the titanium and the, and the iron? Is that constant across the moon? So you really gonna have to be picky about where you locate your your um, habitation as well. Hmm. Yeah, my impression is that, and maybe this just comes from Andy Weir's Artemis book, but oh, yeah. that yeah. that if you mine the say the titanium or the aluminum to build your habitat, that the amount of oxygen because it's all aluminum oxide, the oxygen waste gas is coming out that you actually have too much you have to vent it because you 
yeah can't yeah. use you're getting so much oxygen while you're while you're at it but i wonder yeah and i know, didn't get a sense that they've actually gone that far with this they were just trying to figure out okay we got these rocks we grabbed them here's what we're getting from changi 5 yeah so we i think this is sort of a, a work in progress to show yes that can be done <laughs> and then later on we're going to find out like you said oh we're getting way too much oxygen out of this what do we do yeah but and maybe if you're just going for the water then you're getting the titanium yeah. you're getting the aluminum as a byproduct and you're getting the like you're getting all this useful stuff as a byproduct but yeah. the water is the limiting factor and you just have to pile up mounds of titanium around your station just so you can have a glass of water i wonder yeah what you know i'm being. still really thinking like how much water are you really going to find you can say well we'll synthesize it out of rocks or we're going to run down the poles and grab it we don't really still have a sense of how much there really is i mean you see these numbers being flung yeah. around but reality may be very you know, an order, you know, a few factors different. But, but Chang'e 5 was pulling its sample from the South Pole, which is thought yeah. to be more of yeah. volatile rich than other parts of the moon. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, and so the question is, are there other places like that? Yeah. 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 And then there might be this race to, you know, who's going to get those areas first. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's what's mixed in with the regolith and there's are those, those permanently shadowed craters where there's just yeah. skating rinks yeah. of ice that you can go into and, and scoop it up. And that's still an unknown. All right, Morgan, one last story. Cool picture. Yeah, I, I thought this was a neat callback to uh, an old Mars mission uh, and one of the oldest sort of enduring mysteries on Mars. And you go all the way back to, the Viking missions in the 70s, making the first high resolution pictures. And we saw these weird streaky like things on the surface. And very cleverly, scientists called them, um, oh my God, I can't say the slope, slope streaks. Slope streaks, twang, yeah. twang, twang twister. Um, and there were sort of a whole bunch of ideas about where these things came from. One was they were somehow early thought water. Uh, eventually we sort of deduced that that probably wasn't the case. Uh, some of them are very clearly caused by disturbances of, uh, from an impact crater, like a recent impact. Uh, others might be caused by dust devils. Uh, and in all these cases, sort of what's happening is something is starting off like a little mini landslide of dust. And that dust is just differently colored than the surrounding material, and it forms these, these streaky, slopey um, patterns that we see in pictures. But there was one more kind of enduring idea of where these things might come from. And that's that the starting point was soil that was destabilized through frost activity. Uh, we know here on Earth that frost, the freezing and thawing cycle, can have a really destabilizing effect on loosely adhered soils. Uh, and of course, on Mars, we're talking about carbon dioxide frost, dry ice, not water frost in, in most parts of the atmosphere. Uh, and these streaks have been found quite evenly distributed around the planet. It's not just a polar phenomenon. But we didn't have any real evidence that this frost element was, was part of the picture uh, until now. Uh, and what's neat about this story is that it makes use of the oldest spacecraft still in orbit about Mars, which is Mars Odyssey, mm -hmm. which has been there now for 21 years. That's amazing. Uh, and these are thermal images made with the Themis instrument, which is like a near IR imaging um, spectrograph on the spacecraft. And so it can sense um, the various compositions of materials on the surface. And if you ever see some of those uh, sort of brightly colored rainbowy maps of Mars, some of those are, are compositional maps made by, by Themis. And so what the team from JPL did was go into the data looking specifically at these, the sort of fine scale observations that happened to cross places with known slope, um, slope streaks. And they searched for signatures of carbon dioxide ice and, and they found them all over the place. And so in this picture, the sort of blue tinged areas are places where carbon dioxide frost uh, exists. And you'll notice in many places, they're happening kind of on the edges of craters, and that's because those areas are shaded throughout summer much of the day, which helps keep their temperature down and stop the CO2 ice from sublimating away. Um, and so this seems like kind of a smoking gun that in many cases, uh, this carbon dioxide frost is probably sort of the, the motivating factor 
that causes these slope streaks to happen. And it's just kind of one more reminder of how dynamic the surface of Mars really is. You know, we take these snapshots every few years and think, hey, it's, you know, it's, it looks like it did last time. But really, if you get in down at ground level, there's all sorts of processes from dust devils to frost to wind that's animating particles on the surface and then causing chain reactions that are leading to these orbitally visible effects. Yeah. So, so you've got the, the, I guess, a very steep slope that's in the shadows. It's forming frost. And I kind of imagine, like, I don't know if you get this where, where you are, but in the wintertime we'll get um, like frost will lift up the dirt and it makes this kind of crunchy dirt. And then when the frost sublimates, then it causes like the all this dust to to pull off away from the side of the crater and and go down the slope. It's sort of like at the perfect point where it's about to have an avalanche, and then it it goes down the slope. And then you see, and I guess it's a different color because it hasn't been oxidized in the same way. Like it's just it's fresher material. Yeah, and you know a lot of color derives from the like density of the material. So it could just be that this more finely uh, right. fluffed material has a different uh, reflective appearance. And, and I think you're absolutely right in talking about this sort of crunchy soil that we see in many places here on Earth. And there's good reason on Mars to think that that process would be maybe even more effective because mm. the regolith on Mars is extremely fine. And gravity, of course, is you know only about a third of what it is here on Earth. And so Right. Even a, a light sprinkling of frost could much more easily lift a much larger fraction of the surface fines. And yeah. that m might make this process just really work in a way on Mars that it doesn't even work here on Earth. That's really interesting. Very cool. Well, we've reached the end of our show. Uh, I need to give my uh, co-host a chance to shamelessly self-promote the work that they're doing. Uh, so, Morgan, you talked last. What uh, what are you working on, and where can people find out more? Yeah, well, you can always check out my website, morganrenberg.com. Um, you know, lately I'm sort of settling my life in uh, in new city, new work, and and that's claiming most most of my attention. But I've had a chance to write a few pieces for EOS lately that show up over in their research spotlights, and you can check that out at eos.org. Fantastic, Carolyn. Well, as you said in the beginning, you can find me at Universe Today. I also have run a website called thespacewriter.com. And on uh, Twitter, I'm at Spacewriter. And right at the moment, I'm getting ready to go attend a Star Trek convention starting tomorrow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, okay, I don't, you're braver than me. I wouldn't go to well, a I actually Well, uh, I actually run the science talks at this convention. So I'm yeah. the director of science programming. Well, it's in the beginning all of the you know it's all the all the hand signs and and so on and in the end it's all the covid exposure announcements so so yeah. just you know maybe get an extra few booster shots just just for safety no i'm taking tests and masks with me and i've got yeah. my booster thanks yeah yeah all right and last but not least dr jenks yeah people, um, uh, what are you working on now you're done <laughs> you're well tan. So i'm enjoying being done um, so I'm taking kind of some downtime before I kind of start, start up again, everything. Um, but yeah, you can find me, uh, my website is leahjanks.com. Um, I'm on Twitter where I will be tweeting about the joys of being done with grad school, <laughs> um, is at Leah G. Jenks. Um, and yeah. Fantastic. All right. And of course I'm universe today and all the things we had, uh, two great interviews this week. Um, Tuesday, we talked about the this idea of a liquid telescope. And again, it just blew my mind what is possible. And it's they've just tested the telescope idea with that the Axiom mission on the International Space Station. And it's such a cool idea to build to essentially laws of physics force liquids in space to form very certain shapes that make nice lenses. And you don't have to do anything. You just have to let liquid do liquid things. And it's kind of incredible. Um, and then today I talked to someone about um lunar regolith what can you do that with this nasty stuff that gets into everything and possibly causes damage to the lungs of the astronauts really interesting this is all on my youtube channel i got another uh 
oh, is it going to happen at the same time? as? Anyway, I've got another interview tomorrow. Uh, I hope it's at a different time as the Event Horizon Telescope. But, uh, but I'll be talking um, about uh, sending messages to aliens. And is it a good idea? Uh, well, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. Thanks to every, everyone watching us, both on YouTube and on Twitch. Thank you to all the moderators. Thanks to Nancy Graziano for organizing us. Really, Nancy, couldn't do this without you. Uh, thanks to all my co-hosts, our special guest. Thanks to Pamela and team, the entire team of engineers that we have working with us this week. And uh, we will see all of you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much.